1969, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover labeled the BPP the greatest threat to the internal security of the country. That same year, according to scholar Ward Churchill, 24 Panthers were killed by police, scores more were injured, and at least 749 were jailed. Hoover's counterintelligence program essentially constituted a form of undeclared war against the Panthers. In its efforts to forestall radical social transformation, the FBI was not alone. The NYPD housed a secretive anti-subversive unit called the Bureau of Special Services, BOSS, which had planted at least six undercover agents within the chapter from its inception. BOSS was known for targeting apolitical subjects who presented as blank slates and recruited them into the organization before they completed police academy training so as to prevent them from picking up police lingo. They were part of the founding of the party in New York. Um, One of the key operatives, Gene Roberts, had been Malcolm's bodyguard. He was there at the Audubon Ballroom the night Malcolm was murdered. He was a picture of him in Life magazine giving mouth-to-mouth resuscitation to Malcolm. He comes in with this street cred, Ralph White, and there were five of them. Only three of them testified at trial, but five of them who were part of the founding of the New York Party. I mean, (laughs) you know, the Bureau of Special Services was very sophisticated. They um, they didn't Mm. cotton to the FBI. Mm. They were different. They were much more sophisticated. They were about infiltration and control as opposed to, you know, beat them over the head. Um, During the preparations for the trial, we had a lot of volunteers doing various things. And there was a group working on the Bureau of Special Services, and they found a master's thesis by the head of the Bureau of Special Services at City College about urban intelligence and how it's done. State actors were particularly concerned with the BPP's socialist politics and their combination of community self-help with armed self-defense. In a memo from May of 1969, an exasperated Hoover interpreted the Panthers' free breakfast program as a ploy designed to create an image of civility, assume community control of Negroes, and to fill adolescent children with their insidious poison. In another memo from July, he solicited proposals designed to thwart plans of a New York chapter to utilize the Manhattan-based All Saints Roman Catholic Church School as the site of its program. Hoover's claim that the BPP was filling children with poison is ironic in light of Panther Sophia Bukhari Alston's recollection that, in an attempt to discourage participation, the NYPD spread misinformation that the Panthers were serving poison. The bust. On the morning of April 2nd, 1969, more than 150 NYPD officers executed a mass arrest of 16 members of the New York chapter. By 11 a.m., before most of them had appeared before a judge, Manhattan District Attorney Frank Hogan was standing before the media, reciting the spectacular indictment. 21 Panthers were charged with plotting to kill police officers and bomb police stations, rail stations, department stores, government offices, and the Bronx Botanical Garden. According to former prosecutor Peter L. Zimroth, the indictment was explicitly worded to paint the Panthers as terrorists, disseminate prejudicial information to potential jurors, and legitimize war like responses by the state. Each of the Panther 21, some of whom escaped capture and went underground in Algeria and elsewhere, faced up to 170 years in prison. They included Sundiata Akolai, a computer analyst at NASA. Who I know is Clark Squire. I, I just can't believe his life. I mean, nobody knows, but the only reason he was dragged into the 21 case is that he had lent his car to some of the other Panthers that ended up 
in a shootout with police. Mm. Michael Setawayo Tabor, a drug rehabilitation counselor, Afini Shakur, a school teacher, Daruba bin Wahad, formerly known as Richard Moore, an ex-gang leader and a self-employed painter, and Curtis Powell, a biochemist at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. After they pled not guilty, a state Supreme Court judge set each of their bails at $100,000, an exorbitant sum that all but guaranteed that most of the Panthers would remain imprisoned for the foreseeable future. Asada Shakur would later write, It was well known by everyone in the movement that the New York police had kidnapped the most experienced, able, and intelligent leaders of the New York branch and demanded $100,000 in ransom for each one. Here, we return to my interview with Panther 21 lawyer Gerald Lefko. I asked him what the night of April 2nd was like from his perspective. There, you know, in uh, Stanley Nelson's movie, they have me being interviewed on the street the morning that all the Panthers were rounded up. Mm. Uh, and I'm talking to a famous reporter in New York uh, on camera. And he, I said, it's a total setup. They're trying to destroy the party. We have a history of this in, antagonism between the police and the Panthers. He asked me, do you think it was a frame? And I said, for sure. Mm. And um, that's, you know, sort of how it started. I got into court. Uh, Unbeknownst to me, the prosecutor and um, the DA himself, Frank Hogan, who was as famous a personality as J. Edgar Hoover. He had been the district attorney in New York for 30 years. Mm. Uh, He was Mr. D.A., They had done movies about him. He had a meeting with the chief judge, uh, just the two of them, and decided who the judge was going to be in the Panther case. A man by the name of John Murtaugh, we found this out later, and took that pretrial to the Supreme Court of the United States. We alleged the reason why they picked Murtaugh is Murtaugh was indicted in Brooklyn when he worked for the city and that indictment was dismissed because it should have been in Manhattan Mm. jurisdictionally. And Frank Hogan never indicted him in Manhattan and he went on to become a judge. And this was sort of payback. I asked Gerald what it was like to work with the 21, in particular, Daruba, Lumumba and Afeni. Lumumba had his... He was of a nationalist strain within the party. His father, you know, wore dashiki. Uh, He did five years in state prison because of a fight he had with a a, a, uh, uniformed white officer on a bus. Mm. (laughs) You know, he was involved in jail rebellions. He was extremely powerful and tough. Uh, Daruba was um, very similar, but had one of the biggest mouths. (laughs) Um, It was a fascinating experience. And I was very involved in Afeni because Afeni and Lumumba were very, very close. What was Afeni like? She was very sweet on the one hand, but could be, (laughs) you said something wrong to her, she would flip out. Mm. So she was, uh, like Lumumba, very powerful. Uh, I thought she was very smart. You know, we, she of course was by the time of the trial pregnant and that went on t- through the trial. She was probably seven, eight months pregnant during her summation mm-hmm. <laughs> to the jury, which was, you know, interesting. I also asked Gerald to outline exactly what the state's case was against the Panther 21. So the, the key parts of the case were a conspiracy to murder policemen with explosives. Uh, and to actually set an explosive at the 44th precinct, 
which was across the East River uh, in the Bronx from Manhattan. And uh, there was a spot in Manhattan very high up. The government's theory was when the explosion went off at the precinct, cops would run out of the precinct and rifle holding Panthers would be shooting at them as they were coming out of the precinct. Mm -hmm. That was the major theory of the case. Um, there was people arrested on the um, highway underneath that spot in Manhattan where they were supposed to shoot from. Uh, there were guns in the car. There were guns in every home that was raided on April 2nd, 69 which led to charges. And there were a few incidences that were part of the indictment, but the major thrust of it was a conspiracy to murder police, to blow up department stores, uh, all these allegations of what explosives were gonna be used for various purposes, but primarily against the police. Um, Frank Hogan had a press conference, which he rarely ever had on the day of the uh, arrests, talking about the explosives were going to be set in department stores. There was never any evidence. <laughs> it was just one of these things that just freaked out the world. Uh, and it did freak out the world. Mm. And uh, I must say, Everybody was shunned. Everybody was scared stiff of these allegations. By February 2nd, 1970, most of the Panthers had been in jail for 10 months. In response to this blatant use of the courts for political purposes, the Panthers engaged in their own political counter tactic, relentless disruption of court decorum. Through unceasing verbal tirades, they accused their jailers, the prosecution, the judiciary, and the media of engaging in political warfare. At one point, a melee emerged between several Panthers and the police, resulting in injuries on both sides. By month's end, in response to both these court disorders and to the firebombing of this house by members of the Weather Underground, Judge John M. Murtaugh declared an indefinite recess of the proceedings. He promised to resume the trial only after each defendant had submitted a written and signed statement providing their, quote, assurance that the defendants are now prepared to participate in a trial conducted under the American system of justice, end quote. The Panther 21 maintained a revolutionary disposition, approaching the courtroom as a site of political struggle rather than an arbiter of justice. In lieu of said statement, they submitted an open letter to Judge Murtaugh, a historical critique of what they reframed the American system of justice. This is the New York Panther 21. To justice, John Murtaugh. Read the defendant's name by the state, say that the history of this country has most definitely developed a dual set of social, economical, and political realities, as well as dynamics. One white and the other black, the black experience, or ghetto reality. Collectively authored by the Panther 21, the open letter was transmitted to Murtaugh and the public in the form of a written document and tape recording, read by Setuayo Tabor. The Panthers denounced the vaunted liberal principle of equality before the law as hypocrisy and argued that white culture was stricken with a deep-seated cultural racist phobia of black people in general and particularly of those who resist oppression. Do you not know what we mean when we say no more? What has been done to us by your court, by your DA, is only a reflection of all that that has been infused and permeates this racist society. Black people have said and felt this for over 351 years. They argued that throughout its historical development, U.S. law has operated as an instrument of ruling class domination and racial criminalization. As evidence, they cited the unbroken chain of racist law, 
the tacit authorization of racial slavery in the founding documents of the United States, fugitive slave laws that curtailed black freedom in non-slaveholding states, the Supreme Court's decision in the Dred Scott case, the Black Codes, which effectively criminalized blackness after the Civil War, Ku Klux Klan terror, which persisted through the complicity of the police and courts, and Plessy versus Ferguson, the 1896 case that legalized racial segregation. They further argued that while the Civil Rights Act of 1964 overturned legal segregation, it did so without appending the white supremacist organization of American society. They argued that a narrative of American political development from a black perspective exposed the court's remarkable and ingenious talent for interpreting the law according According to the needs and interests of the dominant white ruling class. Properly translated, it simply means that the farce must go on. The image must remain intact. The political significance of the 21's open hostility towards the authority of established law attains deeper significance when we interpret it in relation to the fledgling efforts of black revolutionary organizations to institute and legitimize new bodies of law. In 1968, citizens of the newly formed Provisional Government of the Republic of New Africa, which sought to succeed from the United States, signed the Declaration of Independence of the Black Nation. In the spring of the following year, some BPP chapters began organizing people's tribunals, makeshift court proceedings in which community members adjudicated conflicts, determined the guilt or innocence of the accused, and handed down penalties on their own authority. The party organ described these tribunals as the only legitimate and just recourse that black people have to redress their grievances, end quote. At the same time, the party was in the early stages of organizing a revolutionary people's constitutional convention where they planned to convene representatives from various radical left organizations on the campus of Howard University in Washington, D.C. in order to author and ratify a new constitution that reimagined the United States as a democratic and anti-imperialist formation. These efforts to delegitimize established law while simultaneously establishing the legitimacy of new law is the sine qua non of revolutionary politics. 